DJs. Here we go! Hey girls, hey boys, superstar DJs. Here we go! Would you like to talk about quantum physics without any of the airy fairy, hippy dippy, new age rubbish that's out there? I would. I'd like to have a serious conversation about quantum physics. So uh, I'm going to be using kind of as my guide this book. The Structure and Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics by who we might affectionately call Rig Hughes. Uh, not a bad book, it was the textbook for a course that I took last year on the philosophy of modern physics. And we're going to start today with the stern gerlach experiment. Okay, so the setup was that they had these two magnets and they fire a beam of silver atoms in between the two magnets. I think they're investigating whether magnetism can be accounted for on the atomic level or something like that. So they want to see what happens when individual atoms go through these magnets. Um, they've got that little V-shape there so that uh, the magnetic field will be non-uniform so there'll be some effect on the atoms. Uh, but what happened was that the beam split into two. It got split into two separate beams, one going upwards and one going downwards. The first, the first attempt at an explanation as to why this happened was to say, yes, there is a magnetic moment in the atoms, and the atoms are just going up or down depending on which direction that magnetic moment inside the atom is facing. But this explanation doesn't really explain the phenomenon because if each atom possessed a magnetic moment, you'd expect it to be equally distributed in terms of the direction in which that magnetic field was facing, and therefore the atoms would just scatter, they wouldn't go in two separate beams. The explanation that prevailed was that the atoms had a quantity of angular momentum to them. Um, so in any given direction they had a quantity of angular momentum, and which way the atom was spinning would determine which way it went. More precisely, the spin is a property of the electrons inside the atom which appear in pairs um, of one spin up, one spin down, um, and there's one odd electron. I think a silver atom has 47 electrons, and so that one odd one out is giving an angular momentum to the entire atom because it's not cancelled out by another electron spinning in the other direction. But for our purposes, it, it's safe to say that the atom itself possesses this property of spin. So now, supposedly, we have two beams, one beam which is composed of spin-up atoms and one which is composed of spin-down. If we were to take, say, the spin-up beam, and place another set of magnets on it, um, we, could, we would expect them all to go in one straight line because we've already sorted whether or not um, they are spin up or spin down and we would still have all the spin up electrons coming through. And that's actually what we see. But if we were to rotate that second magnet so that it was now horizontal, what would we expect to find? Well, what we find is that, again, the beam splits into two, here ostensibly spin left and spin right. So the atom can have a component of spin in any direction, but always consisting of one of two specific values, which is a, a negative and a positive value of the same magnitude, as it turns out. But, if we were to again isolate one of the beams, and put another set of magnets on it, this time vertical again, what would we expect to find? Well, we'd expect to find just one beam coming out, because we know we already tested at the beginning that this beam, we've already tested them whether they're spin up or spin down, and we've just taken one beam and then put it through the horizontal magnet, and now it's in the vertical magnet again. We expect in this beam now we have all of the atoms which are spin up and spin right. So if we put them through vertical magnets again, it would just be one beam, the, the spin up beam. Uh, but that's not what happens. Actually what happens is that the beam splits into two again. Okay, so our explanation has got some incorrect assumptions in it somewhere. Because if our assumptions are correct, then we would expect only one beam. Here's Hughes's description of four assumptions which are implicit in our description. Number one, that when we assign a numerical value to a physical quantity for a system, as we say that the vertical component of spin of an electron is plus a half, Planck's constant, we can think of this quantity 
as a property of the system. That is, we can talk meaningfully of the electron having such and such a vertical component of spin. Number two, that we can assign a value for each physical quantity to a system at any given instant. For example, that we can talk of a silver atom as being both spin up and spin left. Number three, that the apparatus sorts out the atoms according to the values of one particular quantity, such as the values of the vertical component of spin. In other words, according to the properties they possess. Number four, that as it does so, the system's other properties remain unchanged. In the case of our first two experiments, all four of these assumptions hold. However, when we get to the third experiment, on the basis of the first three assumptions, the fourth assumption cannot hold. The fourth assumption, that measuring the system for one property leaves the other properties unchanged, simply cannot hold, because it seems as though our second set of magnets, which is measuring for horizontal component of spin, has interfered with and actually destroyed our previous measurement for a vertical component of spin. Furthermore, it will be the claim of quantum physics that assumption number two should also come into question. In fact, it's not true that we can assign a value for each physical quantity to a system at any given instant. There may be some physical quantities which are incompatible with each other, and this is known most popularly in the example of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, whereby a precise value for the position of a particle is mutually exclusive with a precise value for the momentum of the particle. So this will also bring into question assumption number three, that the measuring apparatus will simply sort out the particles according to the properties that they already possess, whereas it looks in our picture here that the measuring apparatus is actually playing a much more active role in determining which properties the particles possess. So some people have tried to argue that this is an epistemic problem, not an ontological one, that, um, say for example, the uncertainty principle is saying something about how much we can know about a particle, but just because we can't find out its um, position when we know its momentum exactly, um, and vice versa, doesn't mean that it doesn't have a value for that. Um, and this would be called a hidden variables theory of quantum mechanics. And the rest of the videos in this series will, will be towards that point, namely showing that there can be no hidden variables interpretation of quantum mechanics.